back. Um, I'd like to introduce this wonderful couple here who nourished us and fed us um, so well over lunchtime. Um, Peter Knight and Sue Wallace. Um, Peter, well, they, they run Stone Seeker Tours, and um, Peter does many shamanic um, journeying and drumming um, activities and, and pilgrimages in, uh, well, all around this countryside, all around Avery, and also out in the um, in Dartmoor and other places. Um, and every October, I think it is, um, Peter runs the convention of archaeology and earth mysteries in this very hall. What, what's the date of the next one? It's always the first Sunday in October. First Sunday in October, and I highly recommend it. It's slightly different from this, but it's very, very good. Um, so, Peter and Sue are going to um, tell us about Albion Dreamtime. Peter and Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. One, two. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. It's great to be to back again at Gatekeeper. Always a lovely event. And uh, thank you for the three speakers who went previously to us. Um, they've said such a lot that uh, we don't have to say now. So it's wonderful. Oh, hello. Uh, I'm overtoning without knowing it. Sorry. Okay. It's a gift. Is that okay now? Yep, one, yeah. two. So we'd like to talk to you about uh, the Albion Dreamtime project and the book that uh, was birthed as a result of it. And um, we've only just got over an hour, so we'll, 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 we'll get straight into there, really. But it is about looking at things differently from what we've looked at it before. Um, uh, you know, not so much megaliths and ley lines, which we've all done lots of, and wonderful work that is, but perhaps taking things back uh, to the basics. So, for those of us who don't know us, we are two people with a passion for the earth. We host wilderness weekends and shamanic gatherings such as in caves and chambered tombs. And we have founded the Albion Dreamtime Project, which resulted in our latest book. So all things begin and end in Albion's ancient druid rocky shore. William Blake, of course, said that. And Albion, Albion you know, the original name for England, Scotland and Wales, um, has always been held as a very special place, as Stephen uh, said earlier on. Something special and magical about these isles. So our book tells the story of our personal quest to seek out Albion's original dreamtime places of this sacred isle. So it, it, a couple of years ago I did a talk about Dartmoor, you might remember, Dartmoor Mindscapes, about my journey um, all <coughs> over uh, Dartmoor, but looking at not just the archaeology and the stone circles, but at their natural relationship to the land. And I found uh, you know, a lot of sites that were lined up to features on the landscape. And this can be extended elsewhere. This is Castle Rig, how the, that stone mirrors the distant skyline. At Swinside, it does the same thing, and here's another example from um, on Dartmoor. So, um, and I think the reason people were aligning their sites with the high places is because this is where traditionally the gods, the ancestors, the spirits resolved, uh, resided on these high places, sometimes these unobtainable places. And of course, in, in, in holy books around the world, there are lots of instances of holy mountains. So I found out on Dart that Dartmoor mindscapes really, again, naturally progressed to Albion Dreamtime. So we thought, how can we take this concept of, of natural places being, being sacred a little bit further? Because, you know, ourselves included in the past, we'd always focused on stone circles, stone rows, ley lines. Uh, you know, churches, the Knights Templars, and all of that. But how, we were saying, how about if we strip that all away and see if there's something else there after you do that? What about the landscape itself? Isn't that sacred? Our previous speakers today certainly have, have said that it is. So the Albion Dreamtime project, which we've launched, aims to seek out Albion's original sacred places, all of which, all of which are natural, such as waterfalls, rock features, caves, and ancient forests, and a return to simplicity. I think you'll agree we've all, we've all got uh, overcomplicated lives at the moment. Everybody's dashing around, aren't they, like headless chickens in society. Uh, and uh, I think we've also um, uh, complicated perhaps even spirituality and religion, I would humbly suggest. So perhaps um, it's time at this moment of climate change to perhaps to have a look at how we can really uh, create, uh, connect with the Earth Mother at this time of, uh, of great change. So, we're getting back to basics. 
Our focus is not on stone circles or ley lines or anything in this particular project. It's to develop an environmental spirituality to really connect with Mother Earth, just as our hunter-gatherer predecessors used to do. And Albion Dreamtime also had to be a joint venture, a balance of yin and yang, of our yin and yang, the different qualities that we could bring to the project, and of course the balance of that of our Earth Mother Goddess. Yeah, although some, some uh, ladies in Glastonbury might disagree, but you know, the last time I looked, you know, the Earth Goddess had just as much yang composing her as she did yin. You have to, you have to have that balance of yin and yang for creation to occur. You know, that's, that's, that's how it is. Um, so we sought the spirit of Albion's hunter-gatherer pioneers, the spiritual beliefs of Neanderthals and the Mesolithic people, who, unlike the people who came later, lived a symbiotic relationship with the world. In, with the earth. In other words, they only took what was needed to survive and possibly to do ritual activities, I might add to that. Uh, and we all have genetic memories of them inside of us. You know, we all have hunter-gatherer DNA inside of us, for sure. Uh, but there was a difference from the Neolithic. People then, the farmers, took what was necessary to farm. It's as simple as that, uh, with the consequences. In other words, the fall had begun. Now, we're not going to trash everything that occurred in the Neolithic because we are great admirers of the builders of Stonehenge and Avery and the pyramids. How can you not be? And we still take groups around to those sites. But, um, you know, we're looking to see if there's a more pure connection you can get at uh, at this moment of, of, of climate change that we can get other people uh, perhaps to do as well. So there's plenty of evidence of spirituality and shamanism prior to the Neolithic around Europe and even in Albion. There's lots of evidence of that, no doubt about it. So we visited Ice Age and Mesolithic hunter-gatherer places, uh, which were still quite pristine today. It was quite a hunt, but in the end, we ended up with about uh, just under 100 sites. But then, uh, from, the me from the late Mesolithic onwards, uh, it's what you could say, we do discuss this in the book, you could, it could be argued that we've had 4,000 years of a falling from grace. I think the fall from grace was mentioned earlier on. Farming arrived in the Neolithic. The land is now somebody's property. Who said that should be? Uh, and it, inevitably, farming leads to deforestation, uh, industrialization, and then the climax, the culmination of man's spiritual journey on this planet, 5G. <laughs> Yay! So we have information overload today for sure, but do people's lives have meaning or purpose anymore as a whole, as a species? Do they? So, all man's problems spell, stem from our severance from, conscious of, from the consciousness of nature. We're in a climate emergency, and governments are still being far too slow to act. And all our spiritual aspirations will amount to absolutely nothing if our great mother gets too ill to support us. We have lost our way. Civilization has clipped the wings of our spirit. And personally, we often feel the pain of the earth. Literally, physically feel it. So we're seeking to return to previous ways of perception. And we have returned to the land for truth. In all our journeys, as far as I'm aware, the land has never lied to us. So the concept I introduced last time was of the dream time of symbolic landscapes. All the Aboriginal cultures, especially the Aborigines of Australia, speak of this dream time where the earth was created by the gods and beings. And we look at this in quite some length to set the scene in the book. Uh, to them, myths are inscribed on the land, as Peter and others mentioned earlier. Uh, it is the land that gives the stories. It is imprinted with memory. So people don't invent poems and poetry and all this, that and the other. When they tune into the land, it is the land that gifts them something that is already imprinted on the land. And the Aborigines will all tell you that the dream time is still now. You know, the dream time, you could say, is a no time. There's only ever the present. That's page one of Louise Hay, isn't it? Uh, the only power is in the present, because there's only ever been the present uh, in a spiritual sense. So uh, we could kid you that these two uh, faces are uh, perhaps, um, you know, in the Australian outback. You can all see that one there, really weird, massive head, a bit of a flat cap going on there. And look at these called the kissing stones. And, um, you know, but they're not, they're actually in Britain. 
So, you know, one's in Dartmoor, the other one's up in Yorkshire. So, you know, you don't have to go a million miles uh, to, to find um, examples that the dream time is still around Albion today. So how a dream time story is birthed. Previous people talked about uh, the myths today. Uh, you know, the, this conference is, is themed the myth in the landscape. And uh, it could be from a variety of ways, <coughs> the lacra, trees, rocks that resemble something. Look at this one on Dartmoor, um, you know, where there's this huge crone face overlooking, uh, from, <coughs> overlooking from Hound Tor. Um, so perhaps think, rocks have always uh, given us uh, faces, you know, that'll always happen. There's been Samulaka and anthropomorphic rocks as, as long as the Earth, since the Earth solidified. So, uh, and we've all seen the faces in trees. Perhaps they were sensing the pulse of Earth energies, which of course we can douse today with our rods. And those have always gone across the land, so perhaps this is how dragon and serpent energies were birthed. And of course, shamanic journeying. Uh, there's been the shamanic, the, the ritual specialist, of course, whose job it is to go across to the other world and bring back information that's of use to the tribe. So, of course, it may come back with stories uh, that also led to uh, myths being born. The ancient people would have had contact on a daily basis with all the elementals and the fairies. They're all there for st for still for us to speak to. And natural phenomena, what would they have made of storms, rainbows, fog? All this would have been interwoven into the stories. And wisdom from the land is absorbed by osmosis subconsciously. We literally feel it seeping into our bodies as we sit there just listening to Mother Nature. So just a few examples here of... Uh symbolic landscapes. Can you all see the, uh, sorry about the light creeping in here, can you all see the face there? The speaking crone in one of our Albion Dreamtime sites on Great Staple Tour. She's almost opening her mouth as if to speak, you know, perhaps it's an oracular stone and perhaps when the shaman had a few, uh, you know, uh, a few uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms inside them, <laughs> perhaps the, sp the stone did speak. Uh, and look, how would our ancestors have, have uh, explained these rock giants eyeing up each other? You know, so uh, the rocks, the granites on Dartmoor have only weathered about one centimetre in three or four thousand years. So therefore, we're not only looking at similar rocks to what our Mesolithic ancestors might have, have spied, we might actually be looking at the forms that the hunter-gatherers did stop and look at and perhaps wove into their myths. There were giants in the earth in those days. It even says that in the Bible. And look at these two. I think giants still are here. That top one, Carl Bray in Cornwall, has got giant folklore actually attached to it. And the cheese ring, that's almost an alien giant. That must have some stories attached to it too. And it's on the St. Michael line, for those of you who know about the Michael cu currents that run across the country. And we're doing some of these places where we'll be taking our groups to next year. Look at Hound Tor. Hound Tor has a, is associated with the Bowerman and Bowerman's <coughs> nose, the spectral hounds and the wild hunt. And uh, you go up there and we had a look around and then we start seeing all these weird hound dog-like shapes. You know, is this one of the things that even if it doesn't, uh, is, it, even, even if they're not responsible for the origin of the myths, they could certainly be responsible for the myths being perpetuated down the line. And in the distance there are the twin hills or the peaks of Hay Tor which I found was very, very important to uh, the spirituality of, uh, of prehistoric people on Dartmoor. But you can see how myths can be birthed and perpetuated. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was an enchanted land called Albion. Those are actually the first words in our new book, because it seemed that it, we had to be telling this fairy tale story, because this is a fairy tale land. Albion is a storied land, a land of giants, the Fae, dragons, Merlin and Arthur, and Gwynup Neath. And we visited many of these places, such as Troller's Gill, the Fairy Falls, Fairy Pools, Ludd's Church. So all of these places with these, these myths attached just drew us in because we, we had to go and experience what it was all about. Myths are draped across Albion. They're always associated with the specific natural places. 
where the land communicates. And after all, the stone circles were eventually abandoned. Even the Druids mainly used those natural places. So myths, we think, are encapsulated remnants, many of them, of Albion Dreamtime. Because legends ring with truth. Sometimes you just have to read between the lines, as was said earlier. So we sought out Albion's mythologised landscapes, often following the clues from place names. Can you see the dragons? Yeah. Yes, they're all around us still. The drinking <coughs> dragon just off the Isle of Man. The drinking dragon also on the Dorset coast is now called Durdle Door, but the locals still call it the drinking dragon. And the other one is another one on Dartmoor. So, the time of dragons is returning. Peter actually got that message whilst he was climbing up on the back of the Dorset Durdle, um, drinking dragon. So the dragons all over the place, similar crew have always uh, occurred. Would it be possible to turn that light round just a little bit so we can yes. get that, uh, just, just take it off the edge of the screen? A bit more? Uh, it's not this one. Oh, it might be this one. Okay, okay. It's your radiance, darling. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's great. So you can see, I mean, people have always spotted, uh, you know, forms in fires. And uh, these two were spotted when we were going on our way home after going to two of the sites up north one day. This dragon-like uh, creature occurred right across the sun, just before sunset. And look at this one. We're going across the uh, Yorkshire Moors, I think. And this creature is just hovering along the landscape with another spirit coming in. And the point is, these things have always occurred. So prehistoric man was looking at similar things to this. The imagination was fired. So I think prehistoric sacred sites are not always immediately obvious. Uh, look at this one. We've taken our groups here next year. It's opposite Wisman's Wood that some of you might have been to, but nobody goes up to Bear Down Tours. Uh, but look at the Simulacra here in granite, this huge head looking across the landscape. There's a pillar of, of uh, granite here with a rock basin with holy water in it. And look how this one is coming out of the ground like a serpent with a ball underneath it. And all the granite clitter has been cleared out to make a ritual space. You know, this is a ritual, you know, uh, sacred site, even though there's no archaeology here. I recommend uh, the book by Richard Bradley called The Archaeology of Natural Places. And, uh, he, you know, he says, you know, archaeology doesn't have to be man-made. And this, he's a professor. So, you know, this is a new way of looking at things, sacred sites all around the world, and especially the Aborigines and a lot of the Native Americans, uh, sacred sites are very often completely natural, with no enhancement necessary. Oh, caves. Caves. <laughs> Peter dragged me into a lot of caves. I don't do caves. So I dragged her into 17 of them. <laughs> <laughs> they are places of myths, of dwarves and dragons, and all sorts of stories. You're going into the womb of, the, of our Earth Mother. They are really special places. They are liminal. And they almost certainly places of fear, certainly for me. Because I didn't know, you know, if the roof's going to cave in on me or whether I was going to fall down a hole or whatever. You don't know what's in there. It terrified me. But what I've always done in a lot of places, we've been, uh, we go to a lot of churches and we do um, chamber tombs and that sort of thing. And I do chanting. And in these caves, I did chanting. It, it helped me to get in there because it helped to calm me down. But it was also a bit more than that because we realized the importance of sacred sound. Now we all know about the Australian Aborigines who talk about singing the song lines. Are they talking about the energy lines that run across the earth? Because when they walk those song lines, they sing to the land and it rejuvenates the land. And in return, the land rejuvenates them. So, if it applies in Australia, it must still apply here. So, the chanting became very important. The acoustics in caves is incredible. And we, we often found that it was so special. Um, it, it helped to get us in because sometimes we would go to a place and it didn't feel very nice to start with. And so I would say, 
okay, spirit of place, genius loci, do we have permission initially? We would always ask that wherever we went. But then I would say, what do we need to do to actually get into this place? And often I would be told to chant. And I would even be given the, the tune that it wanted me to sing. So every place we went to was a different tune. So I would sing that tune over and over, just maybe half a dozen times, and it changed the energy of the place. It became so much more um, <coughs> enchanted. Can I use that word? Yeah. Because chant is in the middle of that word. And it, it changed the whole vibration of the place. Or did it change the vibration of us? Or did it tune us in to the location? I'm just asking a lot of questions here. I'm not a scientist. I just know what felt good. And it was really special to chant. And each of those places revealed its own song. Own song. So, water. Water is, is essential for life, we all know that. And they're also very magical, mythological places. We all know about the story of Excalibur and various water creatures and dragons. And I'm sure many of you use homeopathy. And water holds memory. Um, some of you may be familiar also with the work of Masuru Emoto. Water is just an incredible place, um, a substance. And all these places offer a lot of healing and life-affirming qualities. So we've got lots of waterfalls and springs and rivers, very special. And here we have Conway Falls. Water, very special. <laughs> Conway Falls, the water here, this is in North and North Wales, for those of you who don't know. The water crashes over Conway Falls, and then it glides slowly downriver into the Fairy Glen, and a really special place where this froth from the falls has, was just gliding across the water and constantly changing shape. And the pictures that came were, it might be a dragon one minute, and then it would look like a bird, and then it would be a cat, and it would be giving me messages. I stood there for ages just watching this water just change different images that were, were coming across the water. And this place is associated with Merlin. So perhaps he would go there for um, scrying purposes or to get messages from the other side. Very special place. So we tuned in and uh, we started writing as we do. We always take a notebook with us when we tune into these places. So we're sitting, uh, the water is, lit, is really rushing by at a rate of knots on Conway, Conway Falls. You can see how turbulent it is there. So uh, th this just came through to us. This little story, I think you could call it. Grandfather Rock calls out to impetuous water. Why the hurry? Slow down, be quiet. Water replies, slow down, be quiet. Look what I can do. I am soft but always hungry. I have eaten through this hill with my insatiable appetite. Can't stop. The rock responds, see you down at the sea then, don't wait for me. Water calls out, couldn't if I wanted to, got to go, got to go. The rock is then silent once more. It waits and watches, as it has always done. It recalls all the times that water has passed this way, and recollects times when Merlin had sat here, seeking the rock's counsel. Wilderness. There are still places, wild places, um, I don't mean Parliament, <laughs> uh, there are still wild places in Britain uh, where you can walk all day and not see anybody. Um, the late great beautiful soul J. Ramsey called such wilderness places places of truth. And um, we still have them in Britain, Dartmoor, parts of Wales, perhaps the Lake District, huge areas of Scotland. They can be unnerving in their spaciousness. Uh, they are edgy, challenging, 
uh, you know, you're out of your comfort zone. But I think we have found when you go out of your comfort zone, that's often when the magic happens. It really is. So we went out in all weathers, day and night. And as we, as we do, and when we take people out, on, out with us onto the moors, uh, they feel a resurfacing of the hunter-gatherer that sleeps in our DNA. It's as if somebody has switched a switch on. And they, whoa, where's this been all my life? So um, fear can be transformed into exhilaration. Trees. Trees, again, obviously essential for life. But there's more than that. Trees have always had their mythology. And every culture around the world has tree stories. Tree of life, the world tree, the tree of knowledge, the Kabbalah, the Idrasel. They are wisdom keepers, particularly the old trees. And they pass on the messages, the memory of the land. They pass that on to the younger trees. They communicate with each other. This is a given, we all know this. But they, they through, the, through the hormones, through, through their um, chemicals, through the leaves, and also through the mycelium with the roots. So trees are so important. We included four forests because trees are just so wonderful. And this one is not so far from here in the Savanac Forest, the beautiful Cathedral Oak. I recommend to go and see it while you're here. So um, we've all seen faces in trees. I hope you can make that one out there. We call that the yew dragon we found at one of our sites in King and Vale. Wow, he's pretty. Yeah, special. Even that glint in the eye is, is original. You know, you don't need Photoshop with Albion Dreamtime. You can stop your subscription, no problem, because there's so much wonderful stuff out there. That one both just stopped us in our tracks. It's about 18 inches long. And the one on the right is not far from here in Alton Priors, next to the church. And um, that U uh, face is just is on the inside of the hollowed out tree. And the point is, things like this have always occurred since man has been in this country. Can you all see that one? Um, ooh, 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 ooh. That's good. You can see this, uh, this creature, like, like a lizard, basking on a rock with its eye, its nose. Look at the clinging to the rock. And it's actually the base of a beech tree. So again, you can see how people's imaginations have always been inspired, and perhaps this is where dryad myths came from, as well as people connecting with the spirits of the trees, and they all have them. Uh, perhaps sometimes it's just through simulacra. So we also had some up-close and personal um, kind of encounters with wildlife, which we put in the book, because they were all part of our journey. Uh, more than we can mention here, that, that stag actually walked right round the side of me to within about two metres. He just walked slowly past me, eyeing me out the corner of his eye. Perhaps he knew there wasn't any danger, and he knew that that's one of my totem animals, it's a stag. Oh, it was a connection that will live with me forever. And uh, the top right one, oh, the lizard. Can mm -hmm. you all see it there? Yes. Just the about lizard. make out the lizard on my boot. We, we were taking a tour across Dartmoor. Peter was up front, and there was a group trailing behind, and then I would bring up the rear, just to make sure that we don't lose anyone. We try not to, don't we? And I'd, and <laughs> I'd spotted this little lizard running through the grass, so I just paused for a moment and connected with it, and he came straight towards me and jumped straight on my boot. And he's, he must have been there for about two minutes. The whole group had to stop eventually, and they all came back to see what was happening was amazing. But we, we get these kind of things happening when we're really feeling connected with Mother Earth and with the creatures around us. The, the raven here, always associated with magic and Odin. And here we were in um, Cornwall. We are visiting the cheese ring. And this raven had spotted us coming and was circling around the whole time we were there and squawking and calling to us. And eventually we, we sat down on a rock and he probably wasn't too happy about it. I think we, was, we decided to have our picnic on his favorite perch because there was poof around and a little pool of water on the rock. Um, so I just had a little conversation with him in raven speak, as you do. With a as you do. Um, and he, he eventually sort of posed for this photograph and, was quite, seemed to be quite appeased for a while. 
and we soon moved off and he went back to his favourite perch. The little beetle at the bottom, he was walking across the path as we were on our way up towards Glen Tarkin um, in Scotland. It's amazing. It's not actual size though, that is. It's not actual size. It's a tiny little beetle, probably about two centimetres long. And he was beautiful. And we just had to wait until he'd crossed the path safely before we could go on. But just the, those magical moments when you just spot every little creature when you're really connected with nature is magical. So we were compelled by spirit to take these journeys to Albion's original sacred places. We felt there was a sense of urgency that somehow time was running out. We really did feel that. And um, we were always gifted more than we expected, every time. Whenever you go out in nature, you will always get more than you expect. Poetry, chants, moments of deeper understandings of the land. And I'm sure some of you have felt it, seen the nature of this group. Sometimes you just get an overwhelming feeling of love. I'm sure a lot of you have felt that. It almost reduces you to tears. And the thing is, that love, that consciousness is always there. It is us that has separated ourselves from it. The, the love is always in the land. So um, we thought we'd go through uh, the second half of the talk, giving you a little um, taste of some of the sites we went to. We can't possibly give you, you know, even a quarter of the places. But we thought we'd, we'd sort of tell you how it's all laid out. Very accessible, somebody recently said. Uh, we, we've divided the country up into little... Uh, rainbow colours, and then in each map, you see there's a load of sites where we found kind of what we think are still pristine sites that we're pretty sure were sacred, you know, before any stone circles were built. And in each section, there's grid references, how to get there, and all that sort of stuff. And um, and also, we, we had a section of what didn't make the list because sometimes we had a we thought somewhere looked like a really great cave, and it was a great cave, but right outside it is a is a is a quarry that is that is the engines and the quarries going on 24/7, even Christmas Day, wasn't it? Yeah. Harbour a cave. So although the cave was magnificent, the noise was ridiculous in the cave. But then we realised that these places that didn't make the gazetteer were actually still the places we needed to go to because they needed the healing probably more than the pristine places. So you're never in the wrong place, as you know. So an awful, a lot of this is also in the book. The places that did, did not make the list uh, also you know, really still mean a lot to us. So, and it's also our personal list, isn't it? Just yeah, a personal yeah. list. We, we want people to tell us about your favourite place. Because I'm sure you've all got your favourite place and it didn't necessarily make our book. I know Glastonbury isn't in there, is it? <gasps> heresy, heresy. Well, if anybody can explain to me a totally unspoiled, unbuilt up, unchristianized or, you know, unaltered place in Glastonbury, please let me know. So, um, but yes, we do mention Glastonbury in the book, because of course it's a brilliant example of the Christianization uh, and even the paganization, paganization of a, a formal um, and a natural place. So. Uh, so just a few sites, starting from the south, going, going north, really. Yeah. Merlin's Cave. I'm sure many of you have been to Merlin's Cave near Tintagel. It's down on the coast, right on, on the beach. So tip here, go at low tide. <laughs> Good tip. <laughs> because the whole cave fills up with water. It's flushed through every day with, with two tides. But the em energies there are amazing. And of course, it's got Arthurian and Merlin myths. It's a really special place. And we were in there doing lots of dowsing and drumming and um, chanting. And while we were in there, Pete was gifted what he was told was the dragon's heartbeat. had changed. We then spotted this in the cliff face. Can you see it? It looked to us just like a dragon. The head, 
the eye, the wings, and it even looks as if he's doing um, like a wake Sand in the rock. Yeah. And we've been there many times before, and it's made a totally a block of quartz, isn't it? And uh, it sticks out the cliff in relief. And I, I'm not aware anybody had photographed that before. And it's facing right into Merlin's cave, where we've just connected with the dragon. Um, so the number of times we've been to Tintagel and uh, have not spotted that because we weren't ready to. So there are always dragons around. So Thurston Arch is another wonderful place on the southwest corner of um, Devon. And it's this massive rock uh, outcrop about 300 yards offshore. So you can only go there at really low tides. And uh, there's a Mesolithic forest was found in the bay. So originally this was right next to uh, the cliff, you know, a bit like some of you might know old Harry Rocks, a sea stack. So, uh, and it's only when you get to it, we had a wonderful uh, calm day, that you realize how big it is. <laughs> and this massive arch, uh, you know, it just towers over you. And, and the energies were amazing, weren't they? The energies were incredible. And we spent quite some time there just, just soaking up the, the atmosphere, really. It was wonderful. Um, and you can see how, how high the tide does come. So this was quite a, an extremely, extremely low tide. And as you can see, the, the water is absolutely still like a mill pond, 300 meters out from the shore. It was quite magical. But we realized that the tide was changing because the seaweed started to move. We thought, uh-oh, better get back to the coast. Good idea. So we picked our way back all through the, the channels, the rocky channels, and admired the crabs and the weeds and the anemones and beautiful, beautiful rocks and pebbles. And when we finally got back to the shore and turned to look back towards the arch, we couldn't see it. This mist had rolled in. The Celts used to call it the dragon's breath. And this was just the view that we got when we got back up the cliff to where the car was parked. And we could just about make out the top of the arch above the mist. It was one of those magical moments that was just so special. And it's one of those magical moments that anyone can, anyone have. can have. So Wisman's Wood is another magical, uh, mythical place on this sacred land associated with the wild hunt and Sununus. Uh, we're going there next year on tours. It's like a, a scene out of Tolkien. You know, these Ents are going to walk past at any time. All the rocks are vying for space for the dwarf oaks. We did a little ritual there, taking our antlers. Uh, but I wanted to take Sue to a very special place I've been to before, where there's this triangular rock that's naturally been, up, I think, naturally uprighted. They do occur like that which I'd had some meditations at before. It was really as a portal to the other world. But Sue's attention, as yours might be, might be drawn to this, standing right next to it. An interesting tree creature. Pete and I spent some time just sitting, meditating, and connecting with whatever wanted to come into us that time. And I connected with this tree. I was sitting quite close to the, the trunk of it, and I could see a very distinct face Right there, just eyes, nose, but no mouth. And I sort of pondered on that for a moment and thought, well, what's that all about then? And of course, trees can communicate, but not in the same way that we do. They can't actually speak up for themselves. So it was telling me that we have to speak up for our, our trees and stop these people who are cutting them down. They're too precious. Yeah, and that, that portal, you know, it, well, you, it's not like, gonna, it, on this occasion, you know, and on previous occasions, it's not like Stargate, it's not going to shoot you off somewhere or give you words that will start a religion. You know, sometimes it's just simple feelings. But on this occasion, when I was sitting with my back to it, it said, actually, Pete, this portal is not an entrance to another world, but rather a tool to open your heart in your world. And surely that's the key, isn't it? That's the key. It's not a matter of going up to the top of Glastonbury Tor and waiting for the mothership to land, you know, because it ain't going to happen. You know, this is the only planet of choice, and this is the world that we have got. And uh, if you weren't meant to be on the Earth, you wouldn't or couldn't be on the Earth. So it's about entering your physicality, I think. Uh, a lot of people 
don't necessarily regard that as valid when they're on a spiritual path, but I think connecting with the earth for us now is the thing. We did a bit of gentle drumming, and this robin, this is the actual robin, bobbed around us as we're gently drumming and just stayed with us for ages, didn't he? He was so curious. I found out afterwards that the robin is actually a familiar of Herne the Hunter. Hey, hey, Oakwood. So, uh, and the wild hunt. Lidford Gorge. Have many of you been to Lidford Gorge? Yes. When we first started doing this project, Lidford Gorge was the top of my list because this has been my special sacred place for nearly 30 years. It's incredible. For those of you who haven't been there, it's a really steep-sided valley with these enormous tall trees. And it's got this incredible waterfall at one end, the White Lady Falls, and at the other end of the valley is another waterfall that's where the water has worn, it, worn its way through the rock to create what is now known as the Devil's Cauldron. The water just boils there. It's a really magical place. And the whole valley is just teeming with nature spirits. It's incredible. So we went in there of the night. Um, shall we share our secret with them? Mm -hmm. It seemed like a nice night. Anybody from the National Trust here? <laughs> Would you tell us if you were? Yeah. Um, thing is that because it's, uh, it takes a long time to walk around the whole of the nature reserve, the whole of the ravine, at the White Lady End, they don't lock the gate of a night. <sighs> so you can go in, which we have done, and we're going to take groups in next year, at, just at the White Lady End. So I've done a night visit before, and you soon realise that you're being watched, that you are not alone. Yes. So I wanted to take you there, and it was pretty special, wasn't it? We decided to go at night, just for that <coughs> added mystery, but also to, to love and honour the water and do a blessing. And as I waded in, I screamed, and Pete said, is it cold? I said, well, yes, it is cold, but it was more than that. It was as if I could actually feel the pain of the water. So, again, I reiterate, we've, we've got to look after this water. It's very precious. There is, there's only 3% of drinking water on the whole world. 3% of the water is drinkable. And it's the same water that the dinosaurs drank. Oh, I love that. It's the same water that the dinosaurs drank. The same water the dinosaurs pooped in. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it. It's constantly <laughs> circulating, but it's, it's so special. And we really must stop trashing the water. It's so <coughs> precious. So, uh, missing us several sites out. Um, Avalon's Hole in Somerset, in Borrington Coombe, not far from Glastonbury. Hey. And uh, it's, it's Britain's oldest Mesolithic cemetery. It's also the uh, scene of some very rare rock art. These geometrical triangles are in the back of the cave overlooking the cemetery. And uh, you go into the, uh, the, womb of the, the womb of the Earth Mother, really. You go down that... I'm not moving. <laughs> um, you go down this, this tunnel for about uh, 75 yards over some rubble, and then you realise why this was chosen for a, a cemetery. That's one of the reasons. Uh, the acoustics are incredible. Absolutely amazing. And as Sue said earlier on, sacred sound is really important as regards where people are going and perhaps even bury their dead. Uh, what we always do, we look around a cave when we go, so we put our torch around and, uh, and we had a look what's on the ceiling. Why have they chosen this cave, not one of the other local ones? So we look up and we see this. This is another, ooh. Okay. So uh, this is about actual size, actually. So uh, this is like cave spirit just floating above us and looking down into the darker parts of the cave where the cemetery was. And this is almost a dry cave now, very little moisture. So perhaps that form in, in the calcium was, was visible in Mesolithic times. Uh, and there's all sorts of other weird things that you can interpret that the rock has done naturally. <coughs> Absolutely incredible. And these things have always occurred. So that's a very easily accessible cave, that one. There's a cafe quite near, isn't there? So another place that a lot of you uh, have been to, I think somebody mentioned it earlier on, um, Dragon Hill at Offington. <coughs> you know, did this qualify? Well, yeah, although there's some talk that Dragon Hill might have been uh, modified, uh, of the top flattened, we're still not sure about that, but certainly the, the main bulk of the hill uh, is natural. It's, it's the Belinus line energies that Gary and Caroline speak about. 
of the Delinus line, they go straight uh, down, down the horse there, there's the white horse of Uffington. The dragon. The dragon, of course it's a dragon, it's not a horse, it's the white dragon of Uffington. Uh, and the, the hill itself has dragon slaying and uh, Arthurian folklore. And uh, we're actually holding a free healing event here on the Bulimus line on St. George's Day next year. So if you want to contact us, we'll let you know about that. And um, we went there on the, uh, on, the, on the shortest day of the year around the solstice. And we actually found something that we were, we, we, we were not aware anybody had seen before. We're there at midday uh, on the week of the solstice <coughs> and the shadow doesn't reach the hill. So in other words, at midday, providing the sun's out, this, this hill can never be in shadow. And I'm not aware anybody had ever recorded that before. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a patch of earth on the top, uh, which we douse, which is supposed to be where the dragon's blood spilt, but it's where the energy nodes meet, so you can see how uh, you know, things get interpreted. And I'm going to just go down again, because we, uh, again, we tuned in... Um, and we had a bit of a, of a bit of a musing, really, but um, this, this, this sort of poem came through. Uh, on the hill of Pendragon, dragons flow. The dragons come, the dragons go. Blood spilt, bare earth, the skin of the land laid bare. But the dragons still flow, if gentler than in days of yore. Here, dragons are stirring, but they need our love, our healing, just as we need theirs. Will Arthur arise from this hill today? Well, Arthur didn't physically rise from the hill today, that day, but perhaps his spirit did in our hearts. And, yeah, we spotted this little mm -hmm. chap, didn't we? I, I did a bit of drumming for a while. Um, you see me there just raising my drum to the, to the air afterwards. And as I looked up, I spotted this form in the clouds mm. that made me think, oh, it's a dragon. It's appeared. And it was so calm, wasn't it? It stayed there for ages. Amazing. So some of our places in Wales, I think three of them, there's three waterfalls you can actually stand behind. <gasps> to stand behind a rushing waterfall is such an experience. And the point is, it always has been. So this is skewed at Ira, isn't it, uh, in the Brecon so. This is a really special place. Um, we visited it a couple of times. The first picture you can see there on the left, I'm wearing a t-shirt, it was summertime. And so we'd, we managed to sort of edge our way through, along the edge of the, the river and tuck ourselves behind the, the waterfall there. And it was exciting and thrilling and still a bit edgy, a bit scary, but it was Okay, it was okay. I could imagine doing that quite, quite easily. But then we went again in February. Um, totally different. It rains in Wales. It rains a lot in Wales. And it had been absolutely tipping down for weeks. And we're all, even though we're kitted out in our full waterproofs, it was a bit scary. We, we edged along the, the, the pathway again and got absolutely soaked. It was great. <laughs> Exhilarating, I think, would be the word. It was a right, it's, it's a place of rites of passage, because as you're there, getting soaked by this waterfall, inches from death, really, <laughs> and, um, you know, you know that thousands of years ago, somebody was doing the same thing there. Somebody was doing the same thing. It was certainly an initiation for me. We've, um, Henry Fall, uh, no, this, this actual fall we've just been to, actually, I've just got a little video to capture the raw power of nature. If I can uh, get my little hand showing. Where's my little hand? Here he is. because it would have ruined the camera. <laughs> it was too wet. So a cave that's more easily and left less uh, life-threatening uh, is the Devil's Gorge. We've gone right up into North Wales now because time's getting on. There's several sites we've had to miss out. Uh, this literally we see as the doorway to Anwen. This cave, deep cave, which we haven't even got to the bottom of yet, uh, lies at the end of this ravine, and it literally sucks you in as you go nearer. 
it wants you to come in and you go down and down about a 45 degree slope but it's a massive cave and uh, I love this shot I'm down the bottom already and I, I'm looking up at Sue tentatively coming down uh, quite some way behind me and considerably slower uh, I love this picture of Sue overcoming her fears I was absolutely petrified because as far as I could see there was a lot of uh, freshly fallen rocks I assured you they weren't a fresh fally rocks, wouldn't they? They were. They were, <laughs> they were definitely freshly fallen rocks. Um, but the acoustics in there were absolutely incredible. It was so vast. It was like a cathedral. And that was the one thing that, that did get me in there and feeling more comfortable eventually but with I, doing the chanting. Yeah, but it reminded me of, a, of a, the war, a quote from the second Star Wars film when Luke is being tempted into the cave. Uh, and Luke says, what's in there? And Yoda says, only what you take in with you. Because the, this thing called fear is only between our ears, nowhere else. So uh, we've done lots of drumming and made lots of videos over the years in these places. But we just wanted to share this one with you from that cave at the Devil's Gorge. And it's the longest uh, echo we've ever had, between three and four seconds. And that doesn't sound very long, but that is a long time for echoes to persist. So we haven't even got anywhere halfway down this cave yet. So um, this is just a little bit, uh, at the end when we do the wolf hound, the wolf howls, you'll, you might appreciate the echo. accessible that is is King Arthur's cave uh, not far from here actually in the in the Y Valley we, we've had gatherings there in uh, the last two years and we're going to do it again uh, next year um, we take groups such as yourself in there as well as our own program it's an Ice Age site all sorts of Ice Age mammals are found there it's also associated with Arthur and Merlin Merlin is supposed to have hidden treasure in there and then uh, covered it up with an enchantment with a spell uh, there's outer chambers as you can see there with some of our group and um, but the inner chambers, if they show up here, uh, are a lot different. There's an inner chamber, which um, is pitch black, really, just a little bit of light coming in. This is night lights lighting up, uh, lit up by our group. I love this effect of the shadow, Sue's shadow cast on the wall. And uh, you can see some faces there, I think. And as far as we can tell, they're just natural, um, you know, formations. But cave walls have often been regarded as membranes to the underworld, places where you can actually pass through. And it, it was associated with King Arthur, this, this cave, and um, it was quite in the early days when I went through, and I, I, I was getting nothing through that day, which, which I realise now is fine. But, um, you know, it was... Um, 
I thought I'd go a bit deeper. So Sue goes off into the, she's gone, she's gone off into the dark chamber, uh, the side chamber, to gently drum and chant, whilst I sit in the main cave. Are you here, Arthur? Are you here, I ask. The, ply, the reply is immediate. I, Arthur, am here and will be as long as you remember me, for I am the spirit of the land, the spirit of Albion. My heart opens as Sue continues to chant and drum, unseen in the other chamber. What do I do, I ask? Do as you and others are doing. For as long as people re-enchant my name out in my sacred land, then one day the spirit of Albion will surely rise again. Thank you, I reply. And I kid you not, at that very moment, Sue falls silent in the other chamber. You couldn't make it up. And I realised that she had been the voice and the drum that had awoken spirit, and I had been the scribe. And at that moment, there was such a whoosh of, of uh, a wind coming in the cave, spirit, the consciousness coming in the cave, and he brought all the leaves in just at the moment we stopped. And um, I, I honestly believe that all of us here can get experiences like that. So going up north now, you've had to miss quite a few sites out. Uh, this is Reynolds Arch at Dovedale. A lot of people might go to Dovedale, walk over the pretty little steps over the River Dove. But how many people have walked up a slope just off the path and, and, and gone to Reynard's Arch. I mean, look at that. It's like you're going into a, a portal to another world because just up the slope, if you scramble up the slope under this huge natural arch, there's a cave. And when you get to the cave, wow, you... <laughs> can you all see that? It's like this big cave, this dementor, you know, and you're walking into its yawning mouth. Absolutely incredible. And the acoustics were amazing. And uh, right at the back of the cave, we spotted this. I don't know whether you can see it too well. It looks like a, a skull, doesn't it? An More than that. An elongated skull. An elongated yes. skull. Da, da, da. But it, yeah. it is actually part of the, the rock formation of the cave itself. But you, you're pretty sure that if ancient man had spotted that, would he have used it as an oracle of some kind? He certainly would have noticed it and revered it in some way. Very special. Fantastic. So uh, another place that's quite easy to get to, really, with a little bit of walking, is Thor's Cave. I mean, look at this. This isn't in the Australian outback. This is, it's like walking into the carcass. This is in Staffordshire, the carcass of a dragon or some huge beast. And it's got two, two doorways, this main entrance and a smaller one at the side. And you walk around the, uh, into the side chambers, and you're like walking in and out of eye sockets and out of mouths. It, it's quite incredible. It has ice age and human remains and some folklore to do with Thor's hammer, you know, bangings are heard in there sometimes in the past. Uh, well, the inner nerd in me worked out that, you know, all the times of the years we could go, we just happened to be there in June, didn't we? Just after the solstice. And I worked out that the sun would shine through this smaller entrance uh, before it set, only for about a week other side of the solstice, which is when we happened to be there. We hadn't planned that, because no one had recorded it. So we're waiting and waiting for the sun to come down round and shine in the side chamber where we were, where we were standing. And uh, you used it to do a little bit of a... While we were waiting, I thought I would try and send a prayer out to Thor. Because who better to send a prayer to for rain than Thor? Because we needed a lot of rain at that time. This was um, last year, May, June, all that time. We'd had droughts in the north. And a lot of the moors were actually catching fire. Oh, Saddled with moors. Saddled with moors was on fire. Yeah. And this was while we were up there. We were, were experiencing a lot of people who were on high alert because of these fires. So I was there with my drum, saying a little prayer. Thor, oh Thor, please bring us sweet, gentle rains. Two days later, it rained. So yeah. I'm going to claim that one. <laughs> claim that one. So after waiting a while, the sun then appeared and shone straight through this narrow entrance into the opposite chamber on the other side, which was equally narrow. And, um, and the most amazing thing was, again, we didn't know any of this was going to be happening, that just before the sun disappears, it casts a narrow beam onto this huge rock, uh, rock pinnacle with this almost luminous rock on the top, which we've got to go back to see what it is. 
And you know that as we're there, that somebody thousands of years ago was observing the same midsummer event. And you can all go and look at that. So a few, a few more sites quickly. Uh, Ramshaw Rocks near Leek, not far from Ludd's Church. This is a, a great ridge of all these Samulika. Look at this. These faces are amazing. This wouldn't look out of place in the Australian outback. And can you all see this one? Yeah. I call it Buddha on a bad day. <laughs> yeah, he's even got like what looks like a spliff coming out the side of his... Uh, not that any of you guys would know what a spliff is. Okay, moving swiftly on. Um, so this is dream time in Albion, not in the Australian outback. So moving up north, another incredible place, Brimham Rocks in Yorkshire. We've had to miss some wonderful sites there, but this is associated with Druidic and fairy folklore. There's even a painting they did in Victorian times of all these fairies dancing around Bear Rock, uh, Dancing Bear. And here's the Dancing Bear today, which Sue really connected with because uh, her totem is a bear. And uh, this one is called the Sphinx, but I think it looks more like a dragon skull. So we've renamed that uh, the Skull of the Dragon. And uh, there's lots of little nooks and crannies that I can go into, like some demented goat. You know, uh, uh, but this one, if you can see there, this has actually got a name. It's called the Druid's Writing Desk. Oh, Did you see it? It's E.T., isn't it? It's E.T. Yeah. It's E.T. It's E.T. E <laughs> and look at this one, it's called Idle Rock. Again, this has folklore. It reminds me, actually, you know, of those headless goddesses on Malta. It so reminds me of those. And this 200 ton rock is balancing on 18 inches of soft rock that's almost eroded away. So I said to Sue, we need a picture. Would you like to go underneath? <laughs> so she did. Actually, it looks like I'm trying to push the rock over, doesn't it? I'm not really. It's, it's merely an illusion. <laughs> I'm holding it up for you. That's what it is. So again, things like this have always occurred. Brimham Rocks is an amazing Albion dream time. One more site in England, Cuthbert's Cave, associated with the famous saint from up north. You go to a magical shamanic place, and the local pagans uh, use that still, because there's some runes carved on some of the stones. So, well, you can see why Cuthbert was uh, drawn to come here. A couple of sites quickly in Scotland. The Devil's Pulpit at Finnish Glen, quite near Loch Lomond, named after the giant Finn McCool. It has devil folklore. Again, uh, they are trying to demonise a place sacred to this guy. Uh, and here it is in a river at the deep ravine, you can, you can get down to the river, uh, is, is the devil's pulpit, but really we call it the shaman's table. But can you all see what's looking over it? Yeah, no one has photographed this. Hundreds of people go here because it was featured in the movie The Game of Thrones, but I'm not aware of a single photo. See, people looking, but they're not seeing. I'll give you a close-up of that. It's about six foot deep. Who says the green man or the giant fin isn't still on the landscape? So the last site we want to show you is the Praying Hands of Mary in Glen Lyon. And sometimes, as well as the fantastic natural rock, <laughs> it's quite incredible, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, associated with uh, the giant again, uh, Fion. And sometimes it's about landscape setting. That's the magic fairy mountain, Shehalian, the central sacred mountain of Scotland. And it's within sight of it, and about an hour's walk from the car. So the landscape setting sometimes has, has got a lot to do with the magic of the place. And uh, when you look at it from the other side, there's this big pregnant mountain that lines up with the gap. It's got some unpronounceable Gaelic name with about 30 syllables in it, so I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. But uh, David Cowan, a, a great dowser, has doused energies coming through here. Several energy lines coming in here, I'm just dowsing them and can confirm that. And, uh, but then you found some acoustic effects, didn't you? Mm, I was playing around with the rocks. As you can see, it, it's very laminated, and some places there were some little air pockets behind the, the surface of the rock. And I was just patting away and tapping out a different tune, doing some of the original rock music. Yes. <laughs> God, moving swiftly on. But it's a magical place. There are several sites like that in Scotland. We haven't got time really to share them. Uh, the Grey Mare's Tail there, of course, Iona. There's several natural sacred wonders on Iona, not just the Abbey. Uh, fairy pools on Sky, and there's lots of other fairy places across Scotland, which we explain how to get there uh, and all that sort of thing. So, um, just to finish with, we, we, there's a whole section in the book called A New Vision for Albion. 
and it explains the project and what are we going to do and how can we connect with the land in a deeper way. Again, it's only about we're only telling you what we have found. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily take all that on board. But we find it's about connecting with the land from the heart. And it's all about intent and respect. That's really, really important. Uh, and challenging ourselves to go beyond our comfort zone because we've often found that's where the magic lies when you just push yourself just slightly beyond where you've been before. And just being in nature to receive land stories. Just sit and listen to the whispers of Gaia. Not with your ears, but with your heart. And be part of the environmental awakening. There's a lot going on at the moment, what with the stories about Blue Planet and um, lots of protests, and whatever level you can do, be part of that environmental awakening and fight for your cause. Even if it's just picking up litter, that's the least we can do, just to show our love for Mother Earth. Yeah, I mean, my spirituality has changed a lot over the years, as I'm sure you, yours has, but uh, I don't see now how I can ever be on a spiritual path and not also be an environmentalist. How does that work? It doesn't anymore. Happy to discuss that after with anybody. Read the books of George Monbiot. Somebody might know his books all about rewilding. He's on about, you know, let's, let's give a lot of the land back to nature. There's some rewilding program projects going on in the South East, some big ones in Scotland. Rewilding is different from conservation. With conservation, you're trying to get the land to stay how it is now, forever. You, know, you don't really want it to change, but rewilding is, is giving a whole track of land and letting it do what it wants to do. So that's, that's the big difference. So please read his books by George Monnier. So in all, the, in all our places we've been to, sometimes a simple honouring is enough. And just to send out your love. What doesn't respond to love? To receive those fleeting moments of Gnosis, the whispers of Gaia, when outside becomes inside. And feel the bliss, the sensuality, and the caress of pure love that comes from that deeper connecting with the land. Be co-creators with the land. Bring new stories in. So at this pivotal time, we are being called to heal the land and mankind. And if we can, then, just perhaps, there may be hope after all. For people will fight to protect that which they love. So the moment we all regard the earth as sacred again, you know, we, can't, we won't possibly allow it to be trashed. And personally, we don't waste time on what we can't change in the world, but we're passionate about what we can. It's all about being passionate, I think. Don't, a quick tip, shall I? Don't waste your time on conspiracies. Because <laughs> conspiracies themselves are designed to bring you down and down until you're so depressed, the whole world. I think conspiracies are the conspiracy. That's how I've come to the conclusion. So spend your time and energy on something more positive, positive I would suggest. So please, uh, if you want to sign up to the Facebook page and post, post your own wonderful stories you've had in natural places, uh, we're open to do local gatekeeper walks. You know, I know there's a lot of local groups, gatekeeper groups around the country. If any of the sites in the book are near you, we'd love to come over and share our experiences at those sites. So finally, just because a path we walk, individually or as a species, is well-trodden, doesn't mean it's the right path. Surely we are all here not to be the same. We're all here to make a difference. So let us walk in peace across Albion, this sacred land of dragons. For the dragon is not only in the land, the dragon is the land. And within our hearts we hold the mysteries of the past and the future. When we send out our love to the earth, we receive back love, unbounded. Thank you very much.